Thanks for watching. Let's talk about Flagyl or metronidazole. This is a drug originally approved in 1963 for treatment of the sexually transmitted infection known as trichomonas vaginalis, or simply a trick infection. In 1997, it was given approval for the extended release form for treatment of bacterial vaginosis. And even though it's an old medicine, more than 11 million prescriptions are written every year for the drug that comes in a standard release tablet, extended release tablet, comes as a capsule intravenous preparation. It was originally discovered in France. It was an antiparasitic agent against Trichomonas vaginalis was discovered in 1959, and then in 1962, when they were treating an individual who happened to have the trichomonas vaginalis, but also had bacterial gingivitis in the mouth, well, the bacterial gingivitis cleared up, so they said, oh, this might be good for certain forms of bacterial infection, as well as the parasitic infections. So, for the most part, the drug is extraordinarily commonly used in people who have symptomatic trichomoniasis, both men and women, often with laboratory confirmation, but it could be used in asymptomatic women who are discovered because they have cervicitis or cervical erosions or endocervicitis, and it also is used for the asymptomatic sexual partners of people who've been diagnosed with having trichomonas, it's used for liver disease caused by amoeba, diarrhea caused by amoeba, used for Helicobacter pylori, the organism that causes stomach ulcers, although that's becoming increasingly resistant, used for periodontal disease, used for C. difficile diarrhea, that's the diarrhea that comes from the overgrowth of bacteria that you get typically because you've killed off the good bacteria with some other kind of antibiotic. If you happen to have mild to moderate disease, maybe the flagell is still good. But if you happen to have severe disease, then you need either vancomycin or difficile, other kind of medicine, because of the resistance. And if you happen to have bacteroides infection or clostridial infections, it doesn't matter where they are. It could be in the bloodstream, could be in the bone and the joints, in the GYN tissues, could be in the heart or in the brain or even in the lower respiratory tract, then flagell seems to be very helpful. Also helpful for Giardia, also helpful sometimes for human or animal bites and for perianal fistulas and the infectious complications of Crohn's disease, used for a person who may develop rosacea, but then if you develop rosacea, it comes as a cream or a gel or a lotion. And oftentimes when women have bacterial vaginosis, it's used as an intravaginal preparation rather than the oral preparation. Now, the spectrum of activity against bacteria are kind of peculiar bacteria. So the clostridium causes gas gangrene. It's used for the gram-negative anaerobes bacteroides that would cause an infection in the abdominal cavity, say, in somebody who has a burst appendix or who has diverticulitis. It's used for protozoal diseases, too, the amoeba or the trichomonas vaginalis or used for gerardia. But it comes with a black box warning because in mice and in rats, it may be a carcinogen, not in hamsters, but in mice and rats, it can cause liver tumors, lung tumors, mammary tumors. It can cause problems with the lymphocytes. So the United States Toxicology Program said, hey, there's reasonable evidence to believe that this is a human carcinogen. And the International Agency for Research on Cancer, part of the World Health Organization, says it's a possible carcinogen. And in studies, it's shown that it can increase the likelihood of lung cancer in women after adjusting for cigarette smoking and causes abnormalities in circulating lymphocytes, none of which is good, obviously. The medicine belongs to the nitroimidazole class of antibiotics, and it's good against the bacteria that don't use oxygen. So standard bacteria use oxygen, but in certain kind of bacteria, like the bacteroides or like the clostridia that don't use oxygen, then this is a very good antibiotic because it gets into the cell. And then once it's in the cell, it forms a free radical after it's been reduced. And then the free radical interacts with the DNA and it interacts with the RNA and it causes significant damage. And that's how the medicine works. That's how it kills the cell. 
Well, unfortunately, the bacteria are kind of smart, and they've been slowly gaining on us. And what they can do is they form different kind of pathways so that they don't get the drug into the cell as much, and sometimes they have an efflux pathway that pushes the drug out, and sometimes they form different kind of pathways so the drug isn't activated. It's not formed in the reduced form that later can go on to be a free radical, and sometimes the cells can actually repair the damage to their own DNA. So, as with any other kind of antibiotic, we have to be careful of the resistance, and resistance is becoming more of a problem. Fortunately, not so much for the Bacteroides and the Fusobacterium, which are major problems, but it is causing a problem with Helicobacter pylori and the Clostridium difficile. So, we don't like to overuse the medication, especially for the colds and for the flu and for yeast infections or candida. And it's also important to realize that, as with any antibiotic, it's associated with some side effects. And the side effects associated with flagell are kind of frequent. So, about a quarter of the people who take it are going to suffer from nausea, a significant number with headache or loss of appetite or vomiting or diarrhea or epigastric discomfort. Just your stomach area doesn't feel right. Often is associated with a sharp metallic taste in the mouth, associated with overgrowth of yeast either in the mouth or in the vagina sometimes a hypersensitivity reaction with urticaria or hives or other kind of rashes and flushing, and sometimes with nasal congestion. It can cause central nervous system abnormalities, so it can cause dizziness and vertigo and incoordination and fainting, aseptic meningitis or weakness or depression. Sometimes can cause confusion or numbness and tingling of the fingers and the toes, and sometimes it can even go on to cause convulsions and has been associated with reversible abnormalities that are present on the MRI. And prolonged use, of course, can lead to either a bacterial superinfection or a fungal superinfection, and we have to worry about even causing C. difficile diarrhea, even though this is one of the treatments for that. Well, the contraindications are if you're hypersensitive to it, don't take it. If you're in the first trimester of pregnancy, obviously don't take it. It can cause psychotic reactions, and people who are alcoholic and being treated with antabuse or disulfuram, if you take the flagell within two weeks of taking the disulfiram, you could have shortness of breath, flushing, increased heart rate, nausea, vomiting, headache, abdominal cramps. And you shouldn't take it within 24 hours of taking alcohol. And the alcohol could be like standard drink, whiskey, wine, or beer, but it could also be the kind of alcohol that's in a cough syrup or a liquid sleep medicine or even in an intravenous medicine. You should wait at least a day if you're taking the alcohol, and if you've had some propylene glycol, which is a relative, you wait at least three days. Well, there are always drug interactions, so you stay away from the antabuse that I mentioned, but also you have to be careful with warfarin, the blood thinner, or lithium, and you should be extraordinarily cautious about taking dilantin or phenytoin or phenobarbital, which could be used for seizure disorders, or cimetidine, and the drug can interfere with certain laboratory testing. So another caution, well, it's well absorbed when it's taken orally. It peaks at about an hour to two, and the plasma concentration seems to go in parallel with the dose. The half-life of the medicine is about eight hours, and the distribution is widespread throughout the body, so much so that the concentration in the blood is basically about the same concentration that you get in the central nervous system or in the breast milk or in the saliva and it gets into the liver at about the same concentration, so that's why it's good for liver abscesses. And when it floats around in the body, only about 20% or so is bound. So that's good, because the rest, the unbound portion, is the active portion. It's excreted in the urine, about 60 to 80%. About 20% is unchanged in the urine. The rest of it goes out in the feces. If you happen to have mild renal disease, that's okay. If you have end-stage renal disease, then the concentration of the drug is going to increase quite markedly. And again, if you have liver disease, mild to moderate, it's going to increase the concentration a little bit. And that's of no concern. But if you have severe liver disease, then uh, this drug is probably not for you. The problem is that in the testing, it's shown that it can cause a lot of damage to some kind of cells. It 
can alter the fertility in some of the tests that are done in men or in male animals, it can cause a change in testicular function, it can lead to degeneration of the seminiferous epithelium, it can cause a decrease in the number of sperm. In women, it has an impact, a negative impact, if the woman happens to be present, it crosses the placental barrier, ends up, if you take it in the first trimester, can cause cleft lip, cleft palate, obviously not an ideal treatment, nor is it for women who are breastfeeding, unless there's an absolute imperative that it must be taken. If you happen to need the drug, then you should probably pump the breast and not use the breast milk for at least 12 to 24 hours after you've taken a dose of the medication. In children, in newborns, it's not recommended. It doesn't seem to be excreted very well for the first three days of life, and then slowly the body is able to excrete the medicine, but it takes about 40 weeks after birth till you can tolerate the drug. So it's not used in newborn or young children, and the same thing goes with geriatric patients. As a person gets older, then the liver can't handle the drug quite as well, and you have to decrease the dose, decrease the concentration, because some metabolites tend to build up in the bloodstream. Now, if you happen to use it either in the intravaginal suppository or the intravaginous gel, then you will get a significant and substantial amount inside the blood as well. When you use it on the skin, then there's no significant problem. If you happen to have trichomonas vaginalis, one way of treating it is single dose, two grams, or you could take one gram, two doses, 12 hours apart. But typically it's used either as a seven-day course of either 250 milligrams three times a day or 500 milligrams three times a day. And it seems that that weak course seems to be better because that allows time to have the consort treated. Now, if you still happen to have symptoms, you might need a second course, but if you need a second course, you should wait at least four to six weeks and you should make sure that you have the infection. And typically the infection isn't because it didn't go away, it's because you got reinfected. Now if you happen to have anaerobic infections with some of those other problems that we talked about, like the bone, the joint, or the heart, then you're going to need a higher dose for a more prolonged interval. If you happen to have bacterial vaginosis, typically it's 500 milligrams twice a day for seven days. Sometimes it could be treated with just one single dose of two grams, also used for other gynecologic disorders. But uh, let's talk about the trichomonas for a moment that it's used mostly to treat. Trichomonas is a disease that's sexually transmitted infection. It's a single cell parasite. It's the most common curable sexually transmitted infection. It's spread through vaginal intercourse or va vagina to vagina, but not through oral sex. And rarely is it spread through men having sex with men through anal sex. Can be spread on through sex toys. And somewhere between 70 and 85% of infections are asymptomatic. It's estimated that if we talk about trichomonas vaginalis, probably somewhere between 3 million and 8 million infections occur each year. It's very important because it's the third most frequent sexually transmitted infection after human papillomavirus, genital warts, and the herpes simplex virus. Now, in women, the symptoms might be urethritis or vaginitis or cervicitis or cervical erosions. Sometimes there's itching in the genitals or burning or redness or discomfort urinating. Sometimes there's a vaginal discharge. Typically it's thin, maybe increased volume. It's clear, it's white more so than being yellow or green. Sometimes it has a bad odor. Sometimes it causes pain during sex. In men it might be asymptomatic or might lead to some itching or irritation inside the penis or maybe some burning after urination or ejaculation or sometimes a discharge, sometimes lead to prostatitis. Now it's important that if a woman is pregnant and happens to have trichomonas vaginalis, of course it can lead to preterm delivery and lead to low birth weight, but more importantly it can be passed on to female newborns who are born through vaginal delivery spread somewhere between 15 and 20 percent. Now fortunately it tends to clear within a year. It's important to realize that both men and women can become asymptomatic carriers. 
In women, the condition can persist for months to years. In men, asymptomatic, well, probably is going to self-cure in a matter of several weeks. But the importance is that the parasite causes local death of cells, which incites some kind of an inflammatory reaction. And that inflammatory reaction puts a person at greater risk of being infected with the human papilloma virus, the HIV virus, the AIDS virus, the herpes simplex virus. And it's not uncommon to find it associated with gonorrhea and with chlamydia. So all sexual concerts need to be treated. You have to get rid of this particular organism. And you can make the diagnosis quite simply, either a wet mount preparation in the doctor's office or they have nuclear, nucleic acid amplification tests some other ways to make the diagnosis. But the most important and interesting news on the front happens to be with endometriosis. Now, this happens in mice only so far. It was reported in early 2019 from Washington University in St. Louis. Animals who were treated with metronidazole, not with vancomycin, not with ampicillin, not with neomycin, but treated with metronidazole, or flagell, after they had surgically implanted deposits of endometriosis, endometrial tissue, it just seemed to disappear. And the inflammation disappeared when they were treated with the flagell. And then, after they were cured, then when bacteria were taken from the colon of animals who had the endometriosis, and was readministered to the animals who were just cured of the endometriosis, the endometriosis seemed to come back. So at least there's the suggestion that maybe endometriosis is at least in part impacted by bacteria that happened to be in the intestine. And it just so happens that flagell or metronidazole seems to be very good for that particular kind of treatment. And it's also important to realize that endometriosis affects somewhere between about 10 and 15 percent of women between the ages of 15 and 40. That means that there are somewhere in excess of 5 million women right now in the United States who have a disease for which we have no curative treatment. And in oftentimes, we don't even have a satisfactory treatment. So something to keep. Uh, track of and see where the research goes on this one. Fortunately, the medicine is very inexpensive. A course of therapy, cash is less than $20, and if you happen to have a coupon, say from GoodRx or something like that, then it's less than $15. Now, if you buy the name brand drug, it still costs, even with the coupon, over $230. So that's the story with flagell or metronidazole, very commonly used drug, has some toxicity, some important toxicity, but it's used for conditions that are very common, oftentimes a sexually transmitted trichomonas. And now maybe, maybe there's a glimmering hope, at least from animal studies, that it might have a role in endometriosis. Keep track of that. Well, if you enjoyed the show, subscribe if you would. Tell a friend. Thanks for watching. I'm Dr. Ken Landau. <music>